Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to Lesson 7 in the series on Genesis, titled The Covenant with Abraham, ready for teaching on May 14, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 7. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we open your word again and we're still in the book of Genesis because in here we find the story of your relationship with man from the very beginning. And this week we're studying about Abram and the amazing things that happened in his relationship with you and with those around him. And today I'd like to pray that your Holy Spirit will help us understand the important things in these passages that we will read and that as we delve into the book of Genesis that we will see your love and your grace and your overarching power that is there for each one of us. And today I'd particularly like to pray for those who may be listening in the Virgin Islands in the Caribbean, for people who may be listening in Beirut, Lebanon, or Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, or Agra in India, Hanoi in Vietnam, or Kampala in Uganda, or Tallinn in Estonia, or Calgary in Canada, and those also in Adelaide in Australia, and Auckland, New Zealand. Lord, I pray that each of us may walk just one step closer with you this week and that our families and those we meet will know that we've spent time with you. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 15 and verse 2. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Let's read that again, Genesis 15 and verse 2. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? With Genesis 15, we come to the crucial moment when God formalizes his covenant with Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant is the second covenant after the covenant with Noah. Like Noah's covenant, Abraham's covenant involves other nations as well, for ultimately the covenant with Abraham is part of the everlasting covenant which is offered to all humanity. We read about this in Genesis 17 verse 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and your descendants after you. And Hebrews 13 and verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. This episode of Abraham's life is full of fear and laughter. Abram is afraid, we read in Genesis 15, 1, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. As a Sarah in Genesis 18:15, But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. And Hagar in Genesis 21:17, and God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Abram laughs, we read in Genesis 17:17. 17, 17, then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is one hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Sarah laughed in Genesis 18, verse 12. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And Ishmael too, we read about in Genesis 21 verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian whom she had borne to Abraham scoffing or laughing. 
These chapters resonate with human sensitivity and warmth. Abram is passionate about the salvation of the wicked Sodomites, he is caring towards Sarah, Hagar and Lot, and he is hospitable toward the three foreigners that we read about in Genesis 18, verses 2 to 6. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him, and when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the ground, and said, My lord, if I have now found favour in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that you may pass by, inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah, and said, Quickly! Make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. It is in this context that Abram, whose name implies nobility and respectability, will have his name changed into Abraham, which means father of many nations, we read in Genesis 17 verse 5. Thus we see here more hints of the universal nature of what God plans to do through his covenant with Abraham. Sunday, May 8. The Faith of Abraham. Read Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 to 21, and Romans chapter 4, verses 3, 4, 9, and 22. How does Abram reveal what it means to live by faith? What is the meaning of the sacrifice that God had Abram perform? Genesis 15, beginning at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down to the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge afterward, they shall go out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and shall be buried at a good old age. But In the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. 
And Romans chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And in verse 9, Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness, and verse 22, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. God's first response to Abram's concern about an heir in Genesis 15, 1-3 is that in verse 4 he says he will have a son from his own body. The same language is used by the prophet Nathan to refer to the seed of the future messianic king, as you read in Second Samuel 7.12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Abram was reassured and believed in the Lord, as we read in Genesis 15, verse 6, because he understood that the fulfilment of God's promise depended not on his own righteousness, but on God's, as we read in verse 6 of Genesis 15. Let's have a look at that again. Genesis 15 and verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And we've just read in Romans chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. This notion is extraordinary, especially in that culture. In the religion of the ancient Egyptians, for instance, judgment was made on the basis of counting one's human works of righteousness against the righteousness of the goddess Mart, who represented divine righteousness. In short, you had to earn salvation. God then sets up a sacrificial ceremony for Abram to perform. Basically, the sacrifice points to Christ's death for our sins. Humans are saved by grace, the gift of God's righteousness, symbolized by these sacrifices. But this particular ceremony conveys spiritual messages for Abram. The praying of the vultures on the sacrificial animals we read about in Genesis 15, 9-11 means that Abram's descendants will suffer slavery for a period of 400 years, as it said in verse 13, or four generations, as it said in verse 16. Then, in the fourth generation, Abram's descendants shall return here, it said in verse 16. The last scene of the sacrificial ceremony is dramatic, a burning torch that passed between those pieces in verse 17. This extraordinary wonder signifies God's commitment to fulfil his covenant promise of giving land to Abram's descendants, as it says in verse 18. The boundaries of this promised land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, in Genesis 15 verse 18, reminds us of the boundaries of the Garden of Eden, and we'll compare that in Genesis chapter 2 verses 13 and 14. The name of the second river is Gihon, it is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hiddekel, it is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria, the fourth river is the Euphrates. This prophecy has, therefore, more in view than just the Exodus and a homeland for Israel. On the distant horizon of this prophecy, in Abraham's descendants taking the country of Canaan, looms the idea of the end-time salvation of God's people, who will return to the Garden of Eden. And so to finish the day, how can we learn to keep focused on Christ and his righteousness as our only hope of salvation? What happens if we try to start counting up our good works?
Monday, May 9, Abraham's Doubts Read Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 to 19. What is the significance of Abram's decision to go with Hagar, even despite God's promise to him? How do the two women represent two attitudes of faith? And we'll also compare that with Galatians 4, 21 to 31. So first of all, Genesis chapter 16 and verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction." He shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. Observe it. It is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And then Galatians chapter 4 verses 21 to 31. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which give birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labour, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. When Abraham doubted in Genesis 15 too, God unambiguously reassured him that he would have a son. Years later, Abram is still without a son. Even after God's last powerful prophecy, Abram seems to have lost his faith. He does not believe any more that it will be possible for him to have a son with Sarai. 
Sarai, feeling hopeless, takes the initiative and urges him to resort to a common practice of that time in the ancient Near East, take a surrogate. Hagar, Sarai's servant, is appointed for this service. The system works. Ironically, this human strategy seemed more efficient than did faith in God's promises. The passage describing Sarai's relation to Abraham echoes the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The two texts share a number of common motives. Sarai, like Eve, is active. Abram, like Adam, is passive. And share common verbs and phrases. Heed the voice, take and give. This parallel between the two stories implies God's disapproval of this course of action. The Apostle Paul refers to this story to make his point about works versus grace in Galatians 4, 23-26, which we've just read. In both accounts, the result is the same. The immediate reward of human work outside the will of God leads to future troubles. Note that God is absent during the whole course of action. Sarai speaks about God, but never speaks to him, nor does God speak to either of them. This absence of God is striking, especially after the intense presence of God in the previous chapter. God then appears to Hagar, but only after she has left the house of Abram. This unexpected appearance discloses God's presence in spite of human attempts to work without him. The reference to the angel of the Lord in Genesis 16.7 is a title that is often identified with the Lord, Yahweh. See Genesis 18.1. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. And verse 13. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? And verse 22. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. This time it is God who takes the initiative and announces to Hagar that she will give birth to a son, Ishmael, whose name means God hears, as we read in Genesis 16 verse 11. Ironically, the story which ends with the idea of hearing, Shama, echoes the hearing at the beginning of the story, when Abram heeded Shama, the voice of Sarai, in Genesis 16 and verse 2. Let's read those two texts. Genesis 16 verse 11, And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. And the same chapter, Genesis 16 verse 2, So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. And so to finish the day, why is it so easy for us to have the same lack of faith that Abram had here? Tuesday, May 10, the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Read Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, and Romans 4, verse 11. What is the spiritual and prophetic significance of the circumcision rite? Genesis 17, beginning at verse 1. When Abram was ninety-nine years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. 
and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout your generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house, or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house, and he who is bought with your money, must be circumcised." and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is one hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his descendants after him. And Romans 4, verse 11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Abram's lack of faith, as seen in the preceding story in Genesis 16, broke the flow of Abram's spiritual journey with God. During that time, God was silent. But now, God speaks again to Abram. God reconnects with Abram and brings him back to the point where he made a covenant with Abram. In Genesis 15, verse 18, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, though, God gives him the sign of that covenant. The meaning of circumcision has been long discussed by scholars, but because the rite of circumcision involves the shedding of blood, it could be understood in the context of sacrifice, signifying that righteousness was imputed to him. We'll look at Exodus 4.25. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me, and Romans 4 verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. It also is significant that this covenant, signified by circumcision, is described in terms that point back to the first messianic prophecy. As we read in Genesis 17 and verse 7 and Genesis 3 verse 15. Genesis 17, verse 17, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And Genesis 3, 15, And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. 
The parallel between the two texts suggests that God's promise to Abram concerns more than just the physical birth of a people. It contains the spiritual promise of salvation for all the peoples of the earth. And the promise of the everlasting covenant in Genesis 17 verse 17 refers to the work of the messianic seed, the sacrifice of Christ that ensures eternal life to all who claim it by faith and all that faith entails. And we compare that with Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Titus 1 verse 2, in hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before time began. Interestingly, this promise of an eternal future is contained in the change of the name of Abram and Sarai. The names of Abram and Sarai referred just to their present status. Abram means exalted father, and Sarai means my princess, the princess of Abram. The change of their names into Abraham and Sarah referred to the future. Abraham means father of many nations, and Sarah means the princess for everyone. In parallel, but not without some irony, the name of Isaac, he will laugh, is a reminder of Abraham's laughter, the first laughter recorded in the scriptures in Genesis 17, verse 17. Let's read that again. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is one hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? It is a laughter of scepticism or maybe of wonder. Either way, though he believed in what the Lord had clearly promised him, Abraham still struggled with living it out in faith and trust. And so to finish today, how can we learn to keep on believing even when at times we struggle with that belief, as did Abraham? Why is it important that we not give up despite times of doubt? Wednesday, May 11, The Son of Promise The last scene of circumcision involved everyone, not only Ishmael, but also all the males of Abraham's household were circumcised, as we read in Genesis seventeen twenty-three to 27 So Abraham took Ishmael his son, all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among them of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very same day, as God had said to him. Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael, and all the men of his house, born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. The word kol, K-O-L, all, Every is repeated four times in this passage. It is against this inclusive background that God appears to Abraham to confirm the promise of a son, Isaac. Read Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 15, and Romans 9, verse 9. What lessons of hospitality do we learn from Abraham's reception of his visitors? How do you explain God's response to Abraham's hospitality? Genesis 18, beginning at verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself 
to the ground and said, My lord, if I have now found favour in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, Here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old... Shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, But you did laugh, and Romans 9, verse 9, For this is the word of promise, At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. It's not clear whether Abraham knew who these strangers were. As we read in Hebrews 13, 2, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels, even though he acted toward them as if God himself were among them. He was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, we read in verse 1 of chapter 18, and because visitors are rare in the desert, he was probably longing to meet with them. Abraham ran toward the men, we read in verse 2, though he was ninety-nine years old. He called one of these persons Adonai, my lord, in verse 3, a title often used for God, as we read in Genesis 20, verse 4, but Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? And Exodus chapter 15 and verse 17, You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. He rushed around them in the preparation of the meal, we read in verses 6 and 7. He stood next to them, attentive to their needs and ready to serve them, we saw in verse 8. Abraham's behaviour toward heavenly strangers will become an inspirational model of hospitality, as we read in Hebrews 13 verse 2. In fact, Abraham's attitude of reference conveys a philosophy of hospitality. Showing respect and care toward strangers is not just a nice gesture of courtesy. The Bible emphasises that it is a religious duty, as if directed toward God himself, as you read in Matthew 25, verses 35 to 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Ironically, God is identified more with the hungry and needy foreigner than with the generous one who receives them. On the other hand, the divine intrusion into the human sphere denotes his grace and love toward humanity. 
This appearance of God anticipates Christ who left his heavenly home and became a human servant to reach humankind, as you read in Philippians 2, 7 and 8. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. God's appearance here provides evidence for the certainty of his promise. We read in verse 10, He sees Sarah, who hides herself behind him. Genesis 18 verse 10, And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him and knows her most intimate thoughts, we read in verse 12 as well. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? He knows that she laughed, and the word laugh is his last word. Her scepticism becomes the place where he will fulfil his word. And so to finish today, dwell more on the idea that God is identified more with the hungry and needy foreigner than with the generous one who receives them. Why is this concept so important for us to remember? Thursday, May 12, Lot in Sodom. Read Genesis chapter 18, verse 16 to chapter 19, verse 29. How does Abraham's prophetic ministry affect his responsibility toward Lot? Let's begin at chapter 18 and verse 16. Then the men arose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have known him, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked? Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I who am dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the fifty righteous, would you destroy it all of the city for lack of five? So he said, If I find there forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him again and said, Suppose there should be forty found there. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of forty. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Indeed now, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of twenty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose 
ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed down with his face toward the ground, and he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house, and spend the night, and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned in to him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast, and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please, let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. Then they said, This one come in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot, and they came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they were weary trying to find the door. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city? Take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to him, Please, no, my lords. Indeed now your servant has found favour in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my house shall live. And he said to him, See, I have favoured you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens, so he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. God's promise of a son to Abraham 
has just been reconfirmed. Yet, instead of enjoying the good news, he engages God in a passionate discussion about the fate of Lot in Sodom. Abraham not only is a prophet to whom God reveals his will, but he is also a prophet who intercedes on behalf of the wicked. The Hebrew phrase, stood before the Lord, in Genesis 18.22, is an idiom for praying. In fact, Abraham challenges God and bargains with him to save Sodom, where his nephew resides. Moving from 50 down to 10, God would have saved the people of Sodom if only 10 Sodomites had been righteous. Of course, when we read the story of what happened when the two angels came to Lot to warn him of what was coming, in chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, we can see just how sick and evil the people had become. It truly was a wicked place, as were many of the nations around them, one reason why eventually they were driven from the land. As we read in Genesis 15:16. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 157 and 158, And now the last night of Sodom was approaching. Already the clouds of vengeance cast their shadows over the devoted city. But men perceived it not. While angels drew near on their mission of destruction, men were dreaming of prosperity and pleasure. The last day was like every other that had come and gone. Evening fell upon a scene of loveliness and security. A landscape of unrivaled beauty was bathed in the rays of the declining sun. The coolness of eventide had called forth the inhabitants of the city, and the pleasure-seeking throngs were passing to and fro, intent upon the enjoyment of the hour. End of quote. In the end, God saved only Lot, his wife, and his two daughters, as we read in Genesis 19 and verse 15, almost half the minimum of ten. The sons-in-law, who did not take Lot's warning seriously, remained in the city, we read in verse 14. That beautiful country was then destroyed. The Hebrew verb hafak, H-A-F-A-K-H, overthrew, occurs several times in this passage. In Genesis 19, verse 21, And he said to him, See, I have favoured you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. In verse 25, so he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. And verse 29, And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. And characterizes the destruction of Sodom, as we read in Genesis 29, verse 23. The whole land is brimstone, salt, and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. And Amos 4 verse 11, I overthrew some of you, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. The idea is that the country has been reversed, just as the flood reversed the original creation. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. The destruction of Sodom is a reversal of the Garden of Eden. As you read in Genesis 13:10. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the Garden of Eden, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zoar. In the destruction of Sodom, we are given a precursor of end-time destruction as well, as we read in Jude verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality 
and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Friday, May 13. Abraham's patient and tenacious plea with God on behalf of the people of Sodom that we read about yesterday in Genesis 18.22-33 should encourage us to pray for the wicked, even though they appear to be in a hopeless condition of sin. Furthermore, God's attentive response to Abraham's insistence and his willingness to forgive for the sake of only ten righteous men is a revolutionary concept, as pointed out by Gerhard Hazel. In the article The Remnant, The History and Theology of the Remnant Idea from Genesis to Isaiah, the third edition, published in 1980, pages 150 and 151. In the extremely revolutionary manner, the old collective thinking which brought the guiltless member of the guilty association under punishment has been transposed into something new. The presence of a remnant of righteous people could have a preserving function for the whole. For the sake of the righteous remnant, Yahweh would in his righteousness, Sedak, T-S-E-D-A-Q-A-H, forgive the wicked city. This notion is widely expanded in the prophetic utterances of the servant of Yahweh who works salvation for many. End of quote. And then Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 140. All around us are souls going down to ruin as hopeless, as terrible as that which befell Sodom. Every day the probation of some is closing, every hour some are passing beyond the reach of mercy. And where are the voices of warning and entreaty to bid the sinner flee from this fearful doom? Where are the hands stretched out to draw him back from death? Where are those who, with humility and persevering faith, are pleading with God for him? The spirit of Abraham was the spirit of Christ. The Son of God is himself the great intercessor in the sinner's behalf. He, who has paid the price for its redemption, knows the worth of the human soul. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, only the rainbow and circumcision are called sign of the covenant. What are the common points and the differences between the two covenants? Three, though called of God and though often used in the New Testament as the example of what it means to live by faith, Abraham at times faltered. What lessons should we learn and not learn from his example? 3. Some people argue against the idea that God will punish the lost, saying that this act would be against God's love. How do we as those who believe that, yes, God will punish the lost, respond to the argument that he doesn't? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled A Teacher's Prayer and it's by Andrew McChesty. A school friend told Selina that she should worship Jesus. You need to go to church because Jesus is coming and when he comes he will take his own, she said. The friend also said only two churches exist in the world, the Seventh-day Adventist Church and another church. Selina, whose parents were not particularly religious, chose the other church because it had a larger building in her village in northern Botswana. After some time, a relative, a boy around her age, invited Selina to the Adventist church. Selina's friends at the other church cautioned her against going. Don't go to that church, said one. You won't come back to your own church, said another. Why should I leave my church? Selina asked. On Sabbath morning, Selina walked with the boy to church. 
The worship service had begun when they arrived. It was so different to Selena. The preacher talked to God like he was talking to a friend. The handshakes after the worship service surprised her. It was as if the church members had been expecting her. Learning that the preacher would conduct a series of sermons, she came back for what turned out to be an evangelistic series. She listened with amazement as the preacher used slides to show that the beasts of Daniel 7 represented world kingdoms up through Jesus' second coming. After the meetings ended, she never returned to her former church. She was baptised and joined the Adventist church. Selina Oranil Nakawi grew up and became a school teacher. More than anything, she wanted to teach children about Jesus at an Adventist school. But there was no Adventist school, so she taught at government schools for 34 years. After retiring, she prayed earnestly about how to be a good witness for God, and she led several evangelistic efforts that resulted in a number of baptisms. But she couldn't forget her desire to teach at an Adventist school. One day, her husband saw a newspaper advertisement seeking teachers for a new Adventist school in Francistown. Selina applied and was accepted at Eastern Gate Primary School, which was constructed with a 13th Sabbath offering in 2015. God had answered her prayers. The daily prayer of all the teachers is for the kids to see God's character in us, Selina said. And there's a lovely photograph and a lovely smile here with Selena. This mission story illustrates the following components of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. Mission objective number four, to strengthen Seventh-day Adventist institutions in upholding freedom, holistic health and hope through Jesus and restoring in people the image of God. And spiritual growth objective number six, to increase accession, retention, reclamation and participation of children, youth and young adults. And you can read more about that at I Will Go 2020. Org. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.